Press freedom is at a global low point with media restrictions on the rise in any number of countries, not excluding our own. The recent politically motivated charge and cyber libel conviction of Maria Ressa, CEO of Philippines media outlet Rappler and former Rappler reporter Reynaldo Santos Jr. is a case in point. Such conditions used to be the hallmark of authoritarian regimes. However, the practice is fast spreading to both new and long established democracies. These global trends are posing an existential threat to press freedom, undermining not only public faith in journalism and the media, but also eroding the very pillars of democracy. Tonight's guests include Marita Spitu, one of the Philippines' most accomplished journalists over three decades. A best-selling author, Marita has written eight books on Philippine current affairs. She is the former editor of Newsbreak, a pioneering political magazine, and is currently editor-at-large of Rappler. Professor Peter Grester spent 25 years as a foreign correspondent and is a founding member of the advocacy group, the Alliance for Journalists' Freedom. He is a regular contributor to the ABC, The Australian, The Sydney Morning Herald, The Conversation and The Guardian. Peter became the centre of a global news storm when he was sentenced to three years jail and spent 400 days behind bars in Egypt on charges he and his Al Jazeera colleagues had aided the Muslim Brotherhood to spread false news. He is the winner of prestigious journalism awards, including a Peabody and a Walkley Award. Scott Wade is the Lay Bureau Chief, Chief of EMTV News with two decades of media experience. He has been a producer and researcher for the ABC's Port Moresby Bureau and the recipient of awards from the Asia Pacific Broadcasting Union and the Pacific News Association. In 2018, Scott was suspended from EMTV after airing a story critical of the PNG government that was later reinstated following a public backlash. Our chair tonight, Stefan Ambruster, is an award-winning correspondent covering Queensland and the Pacific for SBS World News since 2007, and is an industry fellow with the Griffith Asia Institute. He began his journalism career at Brisbane's 4ZZZ Public Radio, followed by a journalistic attachment at the, at the Fiji Broadcasting Commission. This led to a decade working overseas based in London with Dow Jones, CNBC Europe, and the BBC. Scott is also a federal council member of Australia's Union for Journalists, the MEEA, pardon me, Stefan was. Thank you again for joining us. And now can I warmly welcome Stefan to this forum to begin our conversation on press freedom. Good evening, Stefan. And hello, thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, we're, we're all struggling with these new technologies here. Um, so look, I'd, I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar, the Asia Perspectives webinar from the Griffith Asia, Asia Institute. Um, as Chris was saying, we've got a very esteemed panel, a panel of journalists who have joined us from the Philippines, from Australia, and we're still waiting to see if we can get the technology to work all the way to Papua New Guinea, but we have a standby if it doesn't work out. Um, we also have hundreds of you joining us from around the region, from the Asia Pacific region and um, around the world. So we're hoping that you'll enjoy this discussion on press freedom and its role in democracy. It has been a lot of uh, reports come out in recent years that have indicated that press freedom is on the decline across the region. And some would say so is democracy. So I hope you enjoy this discussion and that there will be lots of questions at the end. So we haven't got much time to do this. It's uh, only about an hour's worth. So we'll get started straight away. And I'd just like to put the first question to Maritas from Rappler in the Philippines. Maritas, um, you've told me uh, as we're preparing for this webinar that you think the, the since, since Philippines returned to democratic rule 30 years ago, this is the first time that you feel like that democracy is, or the country is losing its grip on democracy and that state agencies are being used to target journalists and media organizations. Can you explain a little bit more about that and the rule of President Duterte? Yes, uh, in the Philippines, the context is democracy itself is under threat. Uh, this started in 2016, and as you said, this is the first time since we deposed a dictator in 1986 that we're again losing grip of democracy. Duterte was freely elected. So this is the irony. 
uh, dictatorships are no longer you know installed through coups or uh, like in Thailand or what it used to be in the Philippines when uh, Marcos declared martial law. We have a freely elected leader who has started, who has set the tone uh, through his violent drug war wherein thousands have been killed. He sent his political opponent to prison and he has threatened the media. He has, he doesn't brook dissent. He has, as you said, used state agencies to file libel suits, to he has sent the Bureau of Internal Revenue to file tax evasion cases. And he has also sent the regulatory agencies to, for example, the latest is to shut down the largest TV radio network in the Philippines. So we are operating under a climate of fear because of this authoritarian ruler. Okay. Marisa, thanks, thanks very much for that. And we're looking at these issues across the region. So now I'd like to ask Peter Greste. Um, Peter, you've often spoken about media freedom in recent years since you've returned from Egypt. And one of the things you say about media freedom in Australia is that it's at a, at a, in a very fragile, dangerously fragile state, I think is the words that you've used. And you've suggested that the only the only solution is profound legislative change, and and that's in the form of a media freedom act. Why is Australia's sli press freedom sliding? And that's been recorded by reports uh, from various agencies. And what does it say about the Australian government's uh, attitude towards the fourth estate and it being held to account? We, we like to think of ourselves, Stefan, as a, as a liberal society. We like to think that we're very open and. and uh, and accountable. We like to think that we we lead the lead the world and certainly the region in terms of uh, our liberal democratic principles like press freedom. But the fact is that in Australia we've got no constitutional protection for press freedom, not even for freedom of speech. The most we've got is an implied right of political communication, which is only inferred in our constitution. There's nothing actually hardwired into it. And Australia, in fact, is leading the world when it comes to um, national security legislation, draconian national security legislation, which in all sorts of ways, both directly and indirectly, is undermining national security. Um, since 9-11, we've had about 84 pieces of legislation at last count, more than just about any other country um, in the world, not just democracies. And I, I, to my mind, a lot of it changed around 9-11 when we saw a shift from physical conflicts to a conflict over ideas which effectively gave governments a license in this war on terror, gave governments a license to silence those, those avenues for the exchange of ideas. We've seen increasing attempts to police Twitter and Facebook and, and social media. And of course, we've seen a lot of legislation which has made it increasingly difficult for journalists to come after, um, uh, to keep watch on government. Now, I think, I'm not necessarily suggesting that this is an evil conspiracy. A lot of my colleagues think and think that it is. They think that I'm being a bit too kind on the government. But I think what we've seen is a narrative around security, which has really dominated um, the discourse. It's given the government a license to prioritize security over all else. And my concern is that in, tr in, in using the national security lens to undermine some of these democratic principles, what we're doing is actually undermining the very system, which is made as one of the safest and most prosperous and peaceful places on earth in the first place. And I think we need to be careful to protect that. The other thing, and I think in the context of, of this discussion that's really worth remembering, is that Australia has often taken a very, um, very strong leadership role in the region. It's been able to stand on its democratic uh, credentials and really hold a lot of our neighbors, a lot of the emerging democracies to account to, to push them to, to hold the line on some of their, their democratic principles. And in introducing all of these pieces of legislation and shutting down the space that journalists are able to operate, we're losing that capacity for moral authority. And I think that's very important. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Peter. Um, we're still having a few problems with uh, getting the connection up to Scott Wyde in PNG. So um, while we do that, while we're waiting for him to join us, uh, we have we have a member of the Griffith Asia Institute with us. Uh, her name is uh, Dr. Tess Newton Kane. She is an adjunct professor, and she was the chair of what was called the Melanesian Media Freedom Forum last year. It was a gathering of journalists from out, from throughout the region to discuss critical media freedom issues 
in their countries across the Melanesian region. And Scott Wide was part of that group. And they put out a communique about what the, what the issues are that face each of, each of their countries individually, particularly uh, at that time, uh, the situation for the editor of the Vanuatu Daily Post. Uh, Tess, um, if you'd like to join us now, could you just tell us um, what, what was the outcome of the Melanesian Freedom Forum? What does it say about the direction that um, press freedom and democracy is going in in the Pacific region? Good afternoon, Stefan, and thank you for that invitation. So I think the, the Melanesian Media Freedom Forum, which, as you say, gathered um, last year came out of a recognition that across the sub-region, across Melanesia, there were a number of critical issues that were being faced by media practitioners, uh, whether acting as journalists or editors or publishers, and that increasingly what, what we were recognizing, which wasn't a new, a new narrative, but one that, as you say, did have a certain uh, level of urgency at that time, was that in countries where democracy is um, is certainly recognised, and you know all of those countries, you know, the, the independent countries are democracies, that there is still, in terms of, there is still something of a disconnect between the mechanics of democracy, for example, particularly elections, and what you might call democratic culture. And part of that comes down to a recognition on all sides of the equation of what the role of the media is. So we often see instances where consumers of media maybe don't, maybe don't have as much literacy as they might have about why it's important that the media holds leadership to account or asks critical questions around spending or exercise of power. And similarly on the other side, and we've certainly seen some extreme examples of this in places like Papua New Guinea and Fiji and Vanuatu um, of political leaders and political elites uh, not recognising or not accepting that the media has a role to play in asking them to justify decisions that they make or, or how they spend money or how they do or don't exercise power. And, and where that interfaces with the work of the media, we see things like the sorts of things that we heard talked about last November. So we had instances such as we saw with Scott, where he was, uh, the, the uh, government put pressure on his employer to stand him down from his position and then had to walk back from that in the face of quite strong public pressure. We've seen instances of what looks like vexatious litigation against publishers such as Fred Wesley and others involved with the Fiji Times in Fiji. We've seen uh, MPs and, you know, making threats, often quite empty threats of defamation against newspapers in Solomon Islands because they've heard that there's going to be a story that might cast them in a bad light. And we also saw um, when we, we also saw in Vanuatu at that time, uh, a very extreme example with Dan McGarry, who was the media editor of the paper, essentially being stripped of his right to work. Now, I understand that Scott's available, so I'm going to quite happily hand over to an expert. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you very much, Tess, for jumping in there. Now, Scott, um, can, you, can you hear us? I hope so. I hope the line from, from WeWAC is, uh, is good enough. Um, Scott, I'd just, I'd just like you to uh, tell us a little bit about the, the situation with media freedom and democracy in Papua New Guinea at the moment. Thank you, Stefan, Tess, Peter, and everybody else. Um, it, my view has always been that it's, uh, it's deteriorated significantly over the last 10 years. And uh, it's a worrying trend because we've, uh, I, I come from a gen generation where I, I saw the better side of the media um, when, when I was a bit younger, straight out of school. So I saw that and it, this gradual deterioration um, over 10 years, over 15 years has been very worrying for us. And we've, we've also, I think, coupled with that deterioration of uh, media freedoms, the exit of very senior journalists who, of, of course, have had to go on to greener pastures, have had to leave because of, uh, you know, age-related issues. Some have passed on. Um, and we, we've got all of those issues uh, it, it's sort of in a package affecting the media freedom landscape in Papua New Guinea. And uh, it, it's come to the stage where people who, who are actively speaking out both, you know, 
privately on social media, uh, and as well as you know, in our reporting uh, on the mainstream media, have been targeted by you know bureaucrats, politicians, even supporters of uh, bureaucrats and politicians who are who are very hell bent on keeping the media silent on issues, um, and and it's quite difficult. Uh, trying to get a new crop of journalists to actively pursue stories of importance um, because that uh, aspect of mentoring is also lacking in, in the uh, Papua New Guinea free, uh, media landscape. So it's, it's a whole host of issues, especially in Papua New Guinea, where you've got uh, a rise of uh, politicians who want to be heard and very aggressively. Uh, uh, people who are willing to pay journalists to come out and uh, have their views aired. Um, and it, in, in this coronavirus period where we've uh, seen a gradual, also a gradual decline in live coverage, initially people were championing it. And then suddenly, because we were asking the questions that shouldn't have been asked, uh, live coverage has been curtailed. We've got uh, very friendly media going out and putting out their uh, perspectives of politicians, perspectives of people uh, like the health department uh, without much scrutiny. So that's, I guess that's the worrying situation that we have in Papua New Guinea at this point and it's gradual decline, uh, just like in other Pacific Island nations. Scott, thanks very much for that. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, video uh, capabilities with Scott at the moment. We're still working on that, but we'll, um, we'll come back to Scott in a little while. Maritas, I'd like to take uh, that conversation on with, uh, to you now under the um, COVID-19 pandemic that we're experiencing at the moment. We've seen parliaments across the world and in our region suspended, but they're still pushing through legislation um, or trying to push through legislation that, it, that directly affects the media. But there is, there's no uh, democratic scrutiny in terms of the parliamentary process and the media's under pressure. How's that affecting you in the Philippines? Yes, two cases in point in the Philippines. During the pandemic, I think this, the crisis is the, Duterte is using the crisis really to push harder, to uh, push, to restrict freedoms um, harder. So first, the, our parliament, we call them the House of Representatives, or Congress passed an anti-terror law. Uh, the president signed it recently. It will be in effect in, in two days time, I think. And the definition of terrorists is so broad that it can include uh, activists and even media who are critical of the president. So that's number one. Number two, during the pandemic, our Congress refused to grant a license to the largest TV network in the Philippines. I think it's like your nine network or channel nine. It has 40 plus TV stations all over the Philippines. So after 66 years, they can no longer operate. This same station was also shut down during the dictatorship of Marcos in the 70s. So this is uh, the second time they've been shut down. They have, they're composed of news and entertainment. So two actions that the Congress took. And the Congress in the Philippines is controlled by President Duterte. In our history, in our political history, presidents control the lower house because that's the source the, uh, the members of the House of Representatives want to be on the good graces of whoever the president is because it's the source of a budget for their constituents. So in that sense, uh, we're very current with how the pandemic has been used by the president to restrict freedoms. And also, of course, but not parliament, but this was already mentioned earlier, where the court convicted our CEO, Maria Reza, and our former reporter, uh, Ray Santos. Okay, and, and Peter Gressi, we've got a similar situation in Australia where the parliament was suspended for a period of time, but the Australian government is still putting through legislation. Um, you've often said there's, um, that, or highlighted, that more than 80 pieces of, of sec national security legislation has been put through the parliament. I think that works out at, at one piece every three months uh, since, uh, the, since the war on terror started in 2001. What, what's happening in Australia with that security legislation? And how does that impact journalists? 
But there are all sorts of pieces of security. Some of the legislation targets, um, or at least affects journalists far more dramatically than others. In all sorts of ways, a lot of legislation limits um, civil liberties. Um, but let's have a look at a few that that ta that, um, that impact on, on journalists and their capacity to control or, or to access sources, to protect their sources, to protect their information, to investigate government. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the, all, all these pieces of legislation have been introduced in the name of, of protecting us in the war on terror. Um, the data retention legislation was introduced um, at the end of 20, early 2015 um, as a way of giving government agencies the tools that they needed to intercept terrorist communications. That gives a whole host of government agencies the right to access any Australian's metadata. Now, metadata, of course, isn't the content of your communications, it's the information around it. Um, it's the details about who you emailed, when you emailed, where you were at the time, where they were when they received it, who you called, who you texted, and so on, the websites that you visit, and so on. Um, the metadata um, is so rich, in fact, that um, the head of, uh, former head of the CIA, in fact, said they issue kill orders based on the information that they get from metadata. Now, the fact that those that um, legislation exists means that, as I said, government agencies can access it with impunity. We know um, that it's been used illegally on several occasions by government agencies to access journalist metadata, but we also know that it has been used to access, to target the suspected sources of journalist information within government to expose those sources. This is really key because it undermines journalists' capacity to maintain confidential relationships with sources to, 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 to encourage leaks and to hold government to account. This is one of the most fundamental aspects of the way that journalism works. It's why we have shield laws in, 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 um, in which courts accept the journalists' right to protect their sources. This is just one tiny problem. And we know, by the way, from research that I've been doing, that journalists are losing access to their sources as a result of, of the, the, the threats that, um, that data retention legislation poses to that relationship. There's all sorts of other pieces of legislation um, that make it very difficult. Foreign fighter legislation pro uh, criminalizes advocating terrorist ideology, uh, which means that it's very difficult to, to cover the kinds of things that the kinds of people that might be interested in in going out and, and taking part in, in extremist activities you can't quote them without risking falling foul of the law there's espionage legislation which makes it very difficult to um, speak to commonwealth officers to get unauthorized leaks from from commonwealth government officials particularly when it deals with australia's trade and, and international relations there are a whole host of pieces of legislation which are, are, are tightening the screws on the capacity of journalists to do their work um, and even though we're talking about Australia, what we're seeing here really is um, just one, a, a fairly prominent example, a disturbingly prominent example, in fact, of what we're seeing right across the region, the way, in fact, the law is being used um, to, is being weaponized to come after journalists. And I know that Maria has spoken about this in a number, on a number of occasions where she's spoken of lawfare. Sometimes it's national security legislation, but as Marita has just been articulating, um, it's been happening in all sorts of other ways, using tax law, using um, regu media regulations, using defamation law, all sorts of tactics that have really been used in very sinister ways, I think, very cynical ways to really make life incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for good legitimate journalism. Scott, I'd like to bring you in here. Um, in 2020, in, the, in Papua New Guinea, uh, there's been a, um, the, the Attorney General has said that they're preparing to establish a Human Rights Commission. Um, in, in February this year, Parliament voted in support of a whistleblowers bill. And there's also been a bill introduced into Parliament to establish an independent commission against corruption. So we're seeing Papua New Guinea move towards all the legislative structures that would allow more scrutiny and more protections for that scrutiny. Why, why is there still in, in, these attacks on journalists happening? Are, do, do, does this form part of the Papua New Guinea's big man culture where journalists are afraid to challenge authority and politicians can think they can do whatever they want? Yeah, uh, Stefan, in, in, in relation to those uh, laws that have been passed by parliament, there's a lot of skepticism in, in uh, Papua New Guinea about whether the laws uh, will be 
actually implemented by authorities. So it, it's a bit of a concern amongst members of the public, uh, and, and they're just waiting to see how these uh, wonderful legislations, wonderful in quotation marks, will be uh, implemented. Because experience has shown that there's been a lot of have been passed and are sitting on shelves not actually being used by uh, authorities or even if they're, they're tested in the court of law uh, or somebody takes uh, uses that piece of legislation it doesn't reach its end it, it's it's cut its life is cut short in the middle um, in, in terms of uh, the, the state of journalism in Papua New Guinea it's Serious concern, like I had a former diplomat call me up two days ago uh, expressing concerns about the state of media freedom and why journalists weren't actually pursuing uh, the important stories that uh, were of concern. To them. And, you know, one of the basic questions that he asked was, why aren't you challenging the prime minister? And I said, we do. We do challenge the prime minister but we don't get as many opportunities to challenge the prime minister in, in, in within the last five years. We haven't had those opportunities because they shut us down uh, and basically make themselves so inaccessible that we are unable to get to them. Um, and, and it's a huge, huge challenge. You know, they, they virtually stop talking to anyone and it's just one-sided information. And, uh, the public is merciless, you know, the public is merciless, public in Papua New Guinea is merciless, both, you know, on the streets and on social media. So we get slammed a lot uh, for not being the journalists that we should be. Okay, thanks very much for that, Scott. Um, I, I'm very conscious of the time that we've got. And so I'd like to uh, bring in two other issues that are uh, uh, influence media globally, and that's that's leadership shown by various countries. And the media has seen a quite extraordinary attacks on it from the United States, which um, which often uh, puts itself forward as as a champion of the freedom of, of freedom of press in countries. And also, um, there's the, the growing influence of China, which has a very different relationship with the media there. Now, Maritza, I'd like to, I'd like to ask you your your country used to be very close to America, and but uh, your current president uh, looks towards China. How, how, is, how is the role and uh, the influence of those two countries how, and the, the example they're setting, how is that playing out in the Philippines? Well, I think on a personal-to-personal -personal relationship, uh, Duterte, our president, likes Trump, and he has said that. And in fact, uh, they are both the same in that they undermine the mainstream media in, in their countries. Uh, Trump has called, has identified the media as the enemy, same in the Philippines. But I think you know, Duterte was ahead of Trump. He won in uh, July 2016 and Trump came in November. So Duterte has been calling legitimate news organizations critical of him as a purveyor of fake news. He has undermined uh, legitimate media by doing so. He has defined us as the enemy. And the other thing is that, which I think is happening in other countries as well, is the use of state agencies to as disinformation channels uh, to undermine mainstream media and legitimate media. These paid uh, state agencies or, and which um, hire troll farms to discredit uh, independent media is happening very much so in the Philippines. Okay. About China, yeah, we're not really, our concern about China is that they may do, uh, they may conduct this information uh, two years from now, in 2022, when we'll have our presidential elections, just the way they did in, in Taiwan. So we're watching that closely. Mm. Peter, in Australia, we've seen um, uh, the relationship between the press and the government um, as, as well as uh, overwhelmed sometimes by the number of statements coming out and the ability to keep up with what's going on. Um, we, we see that in America a lot, a lot more prominently. How, how's that relationship working out in Australia between the government and the media? And, and are, there, are there influencing factors coming from America and from China? Gosh, it's a big, big complex question, <laughs> Stephen. Uh, you know, 
it's, it's, it, it's becoming increasingly hard for journalists to hold government to account because we're no longer um, literally the medium, the, 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 means, the, the means by which um, government needs to communicate with the public. Um, the government has the capacity to bypass the media altogether, which means that in a lot of respects, the media is less influential and, and less relevant. Um, that, I, I, and although I know that there are a lot of people who will be cheering that very notion, the fact is that um, the media acted not just as a filter, but also um, was capable of, of questioning and challenging a lot of the information that came through government. And now, of course, without, um, without um, with the, the, the government access to social media and being able to communicate directly with the public, we lost that capacity to filter as, as much as we did in the past, but also because of the digital revolution, we've seen business models collapse and we've seen news organizations shedding literally hundreds and thousands of journalists um, and a whole host of news organizations shutting down altogether as a, as a result. And that means that the media simply doesn't have the capacity to hold government to account. Now that's true and here, it's true in the United States, I'm sure it's true in the Philippines um, and in Papua New Guinea and everywhere else. But we've also seen a much more aggressive anti-media uh, message coming out of government. Um, and I think Trump has been at the forefront, the most prominent advocate of that. Veritas has just been talking about the way in which um, President Duterte has targeted, has, has gone after the press. We're seeing it in other authoritarian states like um, Turkey, for example, with President Erdogan um, being the world's leader of, of um, lead, leading in prison, in prisoner of journalists, um, almost all of them on terrorism. And so it's, it's an increasingly difficult problem. And I, I think fundamentally what it means that we need to do is rethink the role of the media in a democracy and radically reimagine um, how it should work to hold governments to account, to, do, to perform its democratic role. Because I think if we lose the, that, that element, which we know has, has been vital to, to, to successful democracies, then I think we are in danger of, of causing fundamental violence to, to this system, which has worked very well for us up until now. Mm -hmm. And Scott, um, I'd, I'd like to uh, ask you the same thing, because we hear much less about the media in Papua New Guinea outside of Papua New Guinea than we hear, for example, what's happening in the Philippines. Um, how, how, how do uh, foreign actors influence the way that the media um, uh, operates in, in P Papua New Guinea? You have, for example, a Malaysian company that runs one of the biggest national newspapers. And uh, how, how, does, um, how does the media respond to that in terms of, of where, where the government policy is and, and how they hold the governments to account? Yes, Stefan, it's, a, it's been quite difficult for journalists operating in Papua New Guinea in terms of, as, as you mentioned, you know, one, one example is the Malaysian-owned uh, newspaper, The National. Um, and Alexander Rini, who is currently the, uh, working out of uh, Samoa, um, was at the forefront of covering stories uh, related to timber uh, operations illegally. And, and he copped a, a fair deal of flack from Rimbunan Hijau and its other actors, including government actors. Um, it, it, you know, in an inst one instance was he, he followed a protest into the Rimbunan Hijau uh, headquarters in Port Mosby and was assaulted himself um, and forced out with other, other, other people who were there. So it, it's... And it's become very frequent. Uh, people have taken it upon themselves to discipline the media. Uh, and some of it is directly related to, uh, you know, foreign actors like uh, timber companies, which are a huge, huge problem uh, where we are. Um, just, uh, I think, uh, two, three days ago, we had uh, uh, somebody who was shot, a landowner who was shot in, in the Oro province by police, uh, acting on orders from the uh, allegedly from the timber company that was operating there so it's it's not just the journalists who are facing the brunt of foreign actors it's also the local people who are facing the brunt of foreign actors and it it's places where they act uh, is quite inaccessible for us to get there quickly and verify the information so it's 
I, I guess it's a challenge that we need to overcome and we're still working on it. Uh, and, and I don't see an end to it in the next 10 years. You know, it's, it, it'll probably be in so we'll take over this, over this job and they'll have a huge, huge uh, problem ahead of them. Great. Okay. Um, the, well done, panelists. That was a fantastic session so far. Now we'd like to go to you in the audience. Uh, watching out there all across the Asia Pacific and, and bring some questions to you. Um, the, the questions have been uh, moderated and we've had a few chosen uh, to put specifically to the panel. One, one that's come up first of all is, and it's, it's a bit of an Australian focused one, but it's in relation to uh, raids that have happened by the Australian Federal Police already here in Australia on journalists. And I think it's probably best that Peter answers this one. Um, the re recent raids on the ABC um, were focused around uh, reportage on um, in Afghanistan, what, what were known as the Afghan files, about killings by special forces there. Um, there's been more reports um, by, carried by the ABC this, this week on that very issue, videos showing the execution of, um, of civilians by special forces. Um, can we expect more raids in Australia by Australian Federal Police on journalists involved in producing that sort of reportage? You know, I think one of the problems that we've got is is embedded in the answer that I'm about to give you, and that's we just don't know. Um, the difficulty is that in the legislation, there is an awful lot of discretion, um, both in, the, in this particular case, um, the, the uh, military has discretion about whether or not to refer um, the case that you're talking about. These are reports done by another ABC journalist, Mark Willis, into further allegations of special forces war crimes in Afghanistan. Um, and of course, that was it was the Afghan files covering the same sort of issue that was the subject of the last ABC raid. So the the uh, defence force or the, the ADF can refer that to the police. It's up to the police to decide whether or not they want to investigate. It's then up to the, the police whether they want to refer it to the the, the um, director of public prosecutions, who then has the discretion to refer it to the attorney general, who then has the discretion about whether or not to to go ahead with it. And so it seems to me that without a clear, well-defined defense and protection for press freedom, and with the capacity for all of these political actors who may or may not be the subject of this kind of reporting to have the choice about whether or not this um, prosecution or investigation should go ahead, it makes it very, very difficult for journalists to operate in that kind of environment. My own view is that there was such a public backlash against the original raids by the AFP on the ABC and also a similar raid the day before on another news corporation journalist, um, that I think the government or the, 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 Fed, the AFP and the government, in fact, will be very hesitant about um, going forward with yet, with yet more raids. I wouldn't rule it out, but I think it is unlikely, but I think it is unlikely for political reasons, not for legal ones. We've got a question from Jim Knoll, and he's the legal advisor for the International Federation of Journal Journalists Asia Pacific. And he, he wanted to raise the issues of uh, press freedom in Timor-Leste, and they're currently looking at in introducing criminal defamation laws. Um, maybe, Marita, you, you could um, jump in on this one. Um, what, can, what can we do across the region to support uh, journalists in other countries facing these sort of laws coming in? and to put pressure on maybe uh, other like governments through our reportage? Yes, I think uh, journalists in uh, Southeast Asia uh, need to speak to each other because apart from Timor-Leste, there's a case, a pending case in Malaysia against the editor or, I think, or publisher of Malaysia, Kini. And this may mean that he could be sent to jail uh, for on contempt charges. So I think we need to to get our, the conversations going so that we can uh, come up with more uh, united stand, help each other, learn from each other, because we're experiencing that in the Philippines as well on another level. So we, that's why we uh, in Rappler are trying to uh, respond to, we're trying to, we're writing, we're calling more attention to what's happening in Malaysia because we're more aware of that. And 
honestly, I've not really followed the Timor Leste case. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, a question for for you that's come in, and it's it's in relation to what was mentioned earlier about your troubles um, in uh, reporting in. Uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, what's the role? What, what is the role of social media in supporting journalists uh, when they are in tricky situations like yours, uh, especially when uh, when it's used from other countries where uh, where people use social media to highlight issues um, in another place? Yeah, we've uh, for MTV, and I speak exclusively for MTV here. Um, we've had a lot of support come from uh, other countries through social media supporting our cause. So when I was sued for defamation in, in 2013 by uh, uh, then Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, uh, there was a lot of support both in country uh, and surprisingly, I was, I was quite surprised that there was a lot of support within Papua New Guinea, but there was an even greater army of supporters overseas uh, mobilizing people on social media, on various forums. Uh, and lending support, you know, and support came through words of encouragement, um, through offers of financing, which, of course, we couldn't uh, accept. Um, and, and from very unlikely allies, politicians themselves. Uh, and and that, that support has lingered on uh, to, into 2018 when I was uh, suspended again and threatened with termination and again with Neville Choi, head of news, who was uh, terminated for not sacking me in 2018. So, yes, social media uh, has played an important role in providing that uh, very strong support externally. And uh, we've been very grateful because sometimes, you know, when, when, when you get sued for defamation, you feel uh, that you're very much alone. Uh, but when you see support like that come from very unlikely allies uh, and people you don't even know it it uh, strengthens your resolve and you know uh, makes you realize why you actually do this job Thanks, can i just jump in here because awesome. one of the things i want to underline is is the value of of public support for these kinds of cases and I know from a number of conversations I've had with Maria that she's convinced that the reason she's not in prison and Rappler is still operating, um, and I think I'm sure Marita, um, Marita, you'll have some thoughts on this, but um, is because of the incredible public support, the groundswell of public support in the Philippines and, and all around the world. I'm here now and not in prison in Egypt because of the unbelievable levels of public support that we had. Scott's just been talking about the role that it played. And so I think that's the really good news. The not so good news is that the level of attention that you need to raise on social media for it to become an issue um, is very difficult and it really only applies. It, it, we've been able to get that support for a relatively small number of journalists, but there are a whole host of others, particularly local journalists who are perhaps operating in, in less prominent regional roles and um, who are in, under enormous pressure who aren't getting the kind of support that they need. And I think that's one of the real tragedies of this. Okay, um, Maritas, would you like to speak to that as well? How 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 social media and and people supporting you? How's how's that worked out with the Rappler case in particular? Because that's got support now from all all across the world. You have the EU. You have um, countries countries making statements about the situation that's happening to you. Yes, we'd like. Uh, we're really grateful for the international support and public attention given to this case. So we would like this to happen to be given also to, let's say, as you were saying earlier, Malaysia and then Timor-Leste, so that uh, it's not just one country, but several countries. And I think this will uh, send a stronger message to the international community that there are other journalists also who are under siege in this part of the world. Okay. Um, now we've had another question uh, about media freedom in Australia, Peter, and it's, re it's in relation to protection of sources uh, with the various pieces of legislation coming in and uh, especially the, the um, legislation that allows people to access or the authorities to access journalists' um, data and mobile phones and other devices. Um, how, how hard is it to be a journalist? Well, how hard will it be to be a journalist in Australia and protect sources with this current uh, legislation that's coming in? Almost impossible is, is the short answer. 
Um, we know, as I mentioned earlier, that the data retention legislation makes, uh, means it's very difficult for journalists to protect sources from their own data. Um, one of the things that the legislation does is that it's set up after the media complaint, it's set up um, a special system for what they call JIWs, journalists information warrants, which um, are secret courts, and I mean completely secret, we don't know who the judges are, we don't know who appears before them, we don't know how they operate, but they are supposed to assess ap warrant applications for um, investigators looking to go into journalist metadata, but there is nothing in the law that stops the investigators going directly to potential sources to investigate their metadata. Um, all of this means that, that journalists have started using very sophisticated um, counter surveillance techniques and encryption, encrypted communications to try and protect that relationship between their sources. The trouble is that there's new telecommunications access bill, which the government introduced, I think about a year or so ago, which gives the government the power to order any telecoms provider um, the capacity to build in um, a backdoor into their encrypted technology so that they can get access to that information. Now, how that's supposed to work is still an open question. Whether it's been used is something we just don't know yet. But these are the kinds of this is the kind of, of arms race, if you like, between journalists and sources and government and their attempts to try and control the flow of information. Um, the fact is that we've needed that, that relationship to hold government to account, to make sure that there is the kind of transparency that makes um, democracies work and keeps, in the words of, uh, to, to, to paraphrase, to bastardize a phrase, of, uh, uh, the famous phrase from Don Chip, the, one of our political leaders, um, to keep the bastards honest. Uh, if we can't get, if there isn't the risk of journalists getting access to sources and exposing corruption and, and, and maladministration and bad behavior in government, then the chances are they'll get away with stuff. And the Australian government says in its defence that, or the, the Attorney General says that any prosecutions that are recommended have to be approved by him before they can proceed. Now, is, is that a solution or is that part no. of the problem? No, that's part of the problem. This is exactly what I was saying earlier. It politicises the decision about whether or not to prosecute. It gives, I mean, you can also, you can very easily imagine a situation in which the Attorney General himself or someone in his office might be the subject of a journalist's investigation. Um, I, it, just, it just, to my mind, what we need fundamentally is a legal protection for press freedom that's described, that's in the very heart and the very DNA of our law that says that there is a, a clearly defined role for a free press in our, in our, in our media, that unless there is um, a clear risk to national security or to private information or commercial and confidence information, journalists should have the right and the capacity to publish in the public interest. Um, I think this is absolutely vital. As long as we don't have that kind of clear description, we're gonna be, we're gonna be struggling. That itself is not a guarantee. The Egyptian government had, um, has uh, more sophisticated protections for press freedom in its constitution than we do in Australia. But if we have that law, at least we've got the kind of leverage that we need to push back against a lot of these pieces of legislation. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, we've only got about a minute left to talk. Uh, Marita, um, as so much focus is on the Philippines at the moment, uh, could you just uh, finish off and tell us what, 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 is, what are you looking for uh, in terms of a solution? Is, is there hope that things will get better in the Philippines in the near term? Well, um, I think I mentioned this to you, Stefan, that we will have our presidential elections in 2022. So uh, we need a change of leader. Uh, one who will who will uh, abide by our democratic values, and in the short term, well, I think this medium term as well, is we're pushing for legislation to decriminalize libel because here it's a criminal uh, act, and we can get to prison for uh, publishing so-called libelous material. So I'm, I'm looking, we're looking forward. We who uh, want to fight for a free press, we're looking forward to. A change of leader. <laughs> okay. Marisa, thank you very much. Scott, uh, any last words that we could have from you about the situation in Papua New Guinea? <laughs> no, no, nothing comes to mind yet, Stephen, but uh, well, thank you very much for having me on this, on this panel. Um, really appreciate it. And thank you, Peter, uh, for your sharing your experiences and uh, everyone else. Yeah.
Okay, and and I'm afraid that's that's where we're going to have to leave the discussion. We're out of time, unfortunately. It's been um, it's been very enlightening. I've I've learned so much more after having already read so much about the situations in the Philippines and in Papua New Guinea, and obviously um, being a working journalist here in Australia. Um, I'd like to hand over now to uh, Professor Caitlin Byrne um, to close this discussion. Caitlin. Thank you so much, Stefan, and thank you to our panellists, Marites, Peter, Scott, even though we couldn't see you, it was fabulous you were able to join us on the line, and also to Tess, who was ready uh, to jump in as well, and Stefan, thank you as well for moderating. If I can just echo Chris Sain's uh, introduction, you know, this has been, you are an incredibly distinguished panel. We've been really lucky to hear from you, and I think in today's information rich hyper connected world you know it's absolutely right that we are talking about um, not just the the dramatic change that's happening in the media landscape right now but we're actually talking about the role that media plays in maintaining our democratic traditions not just for now but i think importantly going forward um, ensuring we've got some resilience built into our democracies for the future and, and so I really do truly thank you for engaging in this discussion. You know, it really struck me that you, as, as journalists, you all play quite a critical role, um, but more than that, you're incredibly cr courageous for coming forward and talking and advocating for the role of media. And, you know, I have such great admiration and I think many in the audience have such admiration for you and for the work you do, so thank you. I think it's particularly important um, that the next generation of journalists can see and hear from you as well as they think about the kind of role they might play um, in a very contested and, and, and difficult world going forward. And I think for all of us in the audience, you know, there's a moment of, of realising we can't be complacent as consumers of media. Uh, and, you know, as citizen journalists, potentially ourselves, there's a role for all of us in ensuring that media is recognised for um, upholding the pillars, being one of those major pillars upholding democracy. So look, thank you again. You've all done a, a truly tremendous job and you've stuck through the technical difficulties as well, which is uh, striking in itself. So if I can also just thank the team at the Australian Centre for Asia Pacific Art at the Queensland Gallery, uh, of modern art. We really love working with you and we love being able to convene these kinds of discussions. I'd love also to thank the team at Griffith Asia Institute who have done a brilliant job once again in bringing together this panel uh, and making sure we were able to get through some of those technical issues uh, to, to enjoy this really rich conversation. Um, so thank you to all of you. Thanks for all of you in the audience and for your, your brilliant questions. We will have more details coming up on our next uh, events. So stay tuned and look forward to catching up with you again. Thank you.